Okay, um, great. So it's it's uh, it's rare that someone emceeing, um, you know, when they're introducing the the last or any speaker, in fact, gets to use the word hero. Um, it's a it's a it's a big word. Oh, obviously, it's a it's a very big word. Um, and I've uh, I've kind of thought long and hard about this because uh, you know I found myself in this lucky position that I am the last person to speak. Um, and you know. The, you know, I am the person who's speaking last. That does not mean I am the keynote. However, you know, there were some, there were some signs along the way. I was delighted, for example, to discover that in everyone's badges, my talk was highlighted, you know, showing that I am the keynote, the hero, the big ticket item. Um, I was a little dismayed then, of course, to go and discover that, uh, in actual fact, uh, everyone's talk uh, was highlighted. Uh, all of the speakers had their own talk highlighted. It was a nice touch. Pissed me off a little bit when I realized, to be honest, that I was just the speaker, and the person who's speaking last. Um, however, let's just give that a bit of thought before I kick off. Uh, I noticed the time was running. Pfft, no, I, the, the final speaker has not started yet. Uh, I guess if we navigate our path to the end of the conference, uh, what we'll find is that uh, there'll be a little speaker introduction. You're enjoying that now. Uh, then there'll be the last talk of the conference, uh, which is when the timer should start. Uh, and then, you know, the MC has been doing a lovely job today uh, of thanking the speakers and kind of concluding things. And then at the end, we'll have some closing remarks for the conference. Now, if we break this down, I think we'll find that it's me, and then it's me, and then it's me, and then it's me. So, frankly, a whole lot of me. Uh, from here, it's me all the way down from here on in. Now, I, um, boo, <laughs> boo, okay. So, it's a shame that some of these people are allowed into the conference that, uh, that react that way. So, no, I mean, I, I've thought long and hard about this, and, you know, I wanted to, I thought I want to seize this opportunity to give myself a giant introduction. But, that seems a bit self-serving. Uh, and so I was asking a few people. Um, Val Head gave me some very uh, useful advice. She said, well, why don't you just introduce the last speaker as it's someone else and someone amazing, nip off, and then come back in a mustache? Um, no, that's, uh, frankly, that uh, doesn't seem very honest. I don't think you'd be very fooled by that. And I was a little bit disappointed in Val for suggesting it, if I'm honest. Um, however, um, as I said, there's no one no one is going to interfere now. It's me all the way through. So if I decide that I want to introduce this last talk as the keynote, then I bloody well shall. Um, I might want to go another level up, uh, and I think of myself as the headliner of this three-day festival. Uh, why the hell not? I could go crazy and uh, you know, start thinking about you know, front trends featuring Phil Hawksworth, which I rather like. The, the nice side effect of this is it also really pisses off the other speakers when I... <laughs> yeah. Now, I'll take that applause not so much as uh, appreciation of my, my being featured, but more of, of a genuine put-down for all of the other speakers, That's uh, particularly the ones who booed. But no, that's, this is, none of this is fair. None of this is fair, I'm sorry to say. I really hope there are pictures of this, by the way, because without context around on the web, it's a win for me. Um, but uh, no, let's have a slight reality check. Um, I'm the person who is speaking last. Um, and so, uh, so I, I noticed the time was going. I've, I don't know. We'll have, I'll, I'll re reset my little timer here, and we'll see how we get on. So we'll, let's, enough faffing around. Let's get into this last talk. So this is the last talk of the day. Now, I've entitled The Fast and the Furious, um, talking about functions as, as a service. Uh, and, you know, like others today, I like a pun. Uh, and I'm very happy the fact that when I play out this particular pun, Vin Diesel gets a little tiara. That's rather nice. Um, I, I actually thought about photoshopping my own face into here, uh, the rock, obviously. Um, but uh, then I realized that this picture that I'd grabbed from the, the web, I don't know who this person is. So I'd already grabbed a picture that someone else had photoshopped themselves into. If I was then to do the same, this would get out onto the web. And before you know it, posters of the Fast and the Furious are just random people standing in a line. Um, that's, that's fine. Um, so, uh, so I've said hello before. I've introduced myself before. I didn't introduce myself as being a technology director uh, working at an agency uh, in London uh, called RGA. Um, 
I've already said that if you want to ask me questions, you can kind of hit me on Twitter. That's fine. That still applies. Grab me outside uh, if need be as well. Um, let me introduce RGA a tiny bit. Um, RGA makes stuff for clients. Uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, what, what on earth could that mean? Well, that's my description. Um, RGA's description is that RGA creates products, services, and communications that help to grow our clients' businesses. That, again, that could mean all sorts of things. Effectively, we're an agency, but we build all kinds of things. The reason that this is worded this way is because the breadth of things that we do is, is huge. We do all kinds of things from you know, TV ads to, um, to retail uh, experiences to, um, to websites to web applications to physical devices, all kinds of things. So it's very, very broad. Um, but I'm a technology director there, uh, and as a result, I sometimes get labeled with this. Uh, the dream crusher. Now, that's a little bit upsetting, but the way that it tends to work is, you know, at any agency, there's a vision, a huge creative vision and a strategy, and at some point, we need to figure out if we can make that. So we're we like to flip that around a little bit and not just have the you know, technologists be the dream crushers who come in and say, actually, science doesn't work that way. Um, but occasionally, you do find yourselves in that unenviable pos position of you know, stifling someone else's ambition. Um, try, and, try and minimize that as much as possible. Now, in this cartoon here, um, you know, this, this was uh, drawn by a good friend of mine who I used to work with once upon a time. Uh, he's depicted here. He's the person whose dream is being crushed by me. Um, and he was so motivated uh, by the fact that he feels that I am a dream crusher that he did me an entire brand experience. So this is my logo as the dream crusher. Um, this is uh, yeah, it's a t-shirt waiting to happen. Um, he rendered me as a supervillain. Uh, he felt so strongly about it. Um, and that's kind of, I, I kind of like that as a way, in a way, but also really upsets me because you know, what I want to do is be able to be in a position to make things come to life and to build something that really delivers on the promise of you know, the ambition. So I tell you this because I want to give you a bit of context of, context for things that I've talked about previously. You know, um, over time, I've given a number of different talks, uh, and the first one that I ever gave was really, you know, it was something called excessive enhancement, and it was really talking about, you know, we should be very careful about what we try and achieve in the browser. We want to make sure that we hit the biggest possible audience. Just because we can doesn't mean that we should, that kind of thing. So careful about what we send down the wire to the browser. And that kind of, kind of moved on, and meant the next talk that I gave was really bitching and moaning about content management systems you know, and how they are a really good way of taking the control out of front-end developers, so you end up pushing all kinds of nonsense down the wire to browsers, and it's hard to do good work there. And so I was looking for simplicity and ways to do things differently in that space. And that led me on to my next kind of, kind of talk, which was about static sites and like much, much uh, simpler architectures um, and how those could kind of solve some of the problems of the things earlier on. And then, you know, from there, I'm kind of looking to where I can go uh, from there. And this, that's what this talk is, really. It's trying to look at static sites are great, but how do we push the envelope a little bit? And so this is all kind of looking backwards a little bit, but I want to just really give you the impression that, you know, what I really care about is, you know, empowerment and responsibility for front-end developers, and really for web developers. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about putting the, the power to really have that kind of craftsmanship in the people that need it. And so, you know, I've got, I've got this thing in my sights of I want to make making things simple. Now, that is a bit of a kind of a dangerous, easy thing to say. This word simple here is very easy just to kind of bandy around. Really, what I'm talking about is, you know, I want to make making things less complex. You know, complexity is a bit of a barrier. And, you know, Maciej, at, at the very beginning of the conference, talked about the, com the curse of complexity. And I, I really am with him on that. You know, I'm really conscious that you know, complexity can be a barrier. Uh, and I also think that simplicity is a huge enabler. Um, but it's, it's very often hard to achieve that. So you know, I've said all of that, so why on earth this kind of title choice? Well, you know, this, there may be a slightly more appropriate talk for it, really. Cause, but I'm really thinking about functions as a service and microservices as things that are other people's domain, things that you can make use of. Um, there's also the fact that, you know, with this title, The Fast and the Furious, this gives me all kinds of longevity because this is an event, an event I really, really like. I'd love to come back and do other talks in the future. And so The Fast and the Furious, of course, gives me access to Fast and the Furious 2, Fast and the Furious 3, 
four, five, six, seven. Uh, and it just goes on forever, like the franchise. It feels like I could be giving a version of this talk forever. But really, a better talk, might, a, a title for this talk might have been Offloading Complexity, because that's what I'm really thinking about. You know, it used to be that life was simple when it came to, be, came to building things on the web. You know, a website, you know, once upon a time, was this collection of static assets. And we'd be able to put those onto a web server, and a web server's incredibly good at serving up those assets. And that was nice and simple. But you know, if we look a bit deeper now into what a website is and how those things are often constructed, there's lots of moving parts. You know, we might you know, have uh, some views in there that get rendered. Those might be, you know, we might direct users to those by particular kind of routing rules. They might be populated by some kind of application logic that's kind of getting its data from a database. There might be some kind of caching layer on top of that. We might wrap all of that in a server or a number of servers. Chances are we will have a number of servers so that we can do things like load balancing. We've got staging environments. We've got QA environments. We might have CMSs that are either on the same servers or on completely different environments. We might have dear, uh, dear, uh, digital asset management systems as well, where static assets, image assets, all kinds of things are managed and curated. There might be other services, pricing, tax, you know, uh, fulfillment, all kinds of things, maybe an external logging system. This is by no means a specification. Don't build anything like this. Uh, but what I'm saying is that you know, there are a lot of moving parts. And to try and find someone who can maintain all of that and manage that and have the skills, you're looking for a very particular kind of a person. And you know, let's be honest, it won't be one person. Chances are you're going to need a whole team of people who've got a very broad range of skills. This, by the way, if you ever need to find a set of pictures for one man band, the Google image search for it is terrifying when you see all of these together, but uh, be that as it may. So as I mentioned, I'm really keen on ways to make things a bit more simple. How can we make making things more simple? And so you know, just kind of harking back to a previous talk, I'm going static much more often. You know, I very regularly find myself proposing a static site architecture. And I'm by no means the first person to do that. You know, this phrase, bake, don't fry, was popularized by Aaron Swartz, where he's talking about rather than serving up on demand per request, something that you, that you create on the fly, you bake something ahead of time so it's ready to serve. And his motivation for that was kind of similar to what I'm thinking about. You know, he, he, he blogged about this uh, way back in 2002. And he said, I care, not a, I care about not having to maintain cranky AOL server, Postgres, and Oracle installs. And yeah. Same shit. I don't want to have to deal with all of this stuff. It's complicated and it can be brittle at times. So, you know, I've been concentrating a lot of effort on static sites and static site architectures. But, you know, I'll be the first to admit that static sites are limited. However, I'd also say that the ceiling is far higher than you might think. Could someone bring me some water? I think I left a bottle of water over there. Oh, thank you. Oh, even though I took the piss out of his uh, wrist strap. Oh, so I wouldn't have been able to switch hands had I been strapped in. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That, was a, that was a terrible thank you, wasn't it? So yeah, the ceiling for these things, I think, is much higher than we might have thought. And you know, the word static itself has kind of got a lot of bad press. People think of it as being very dull, very limited. Um, and so there's been a bit of a now, a rebrand almost. You know, this term Jamstack, which people may have encountered, you know, is talking about JavaScript, APIs, and markup. And it's a term popularized by someone called Matthias Billman, who's a founder of a company called Netlify, who I'll talk about shortly. But really, it's the same thing. It's, it's static sites. There's no moving parts. And you know, there are regular criticisms about static sites. You know, there are lots of things you can't do. You can't have a site search, for example. Well, actually, it turns out, yes, you can. And we can talk about techniques for that. You can't have forms on a static site because there's nowhere to post the data to. Actually, yes, once again, you, you can do that. Um, you can't have comments if you can't have forms. Well, actually, there are techniques. You, know, you can't have content management. Well, we heard just the other day from, uh, from, from Stefan from uh, Contentful, and you know, he, they, their company can bring ways to do that as well. So you don't get me started on these things, but a lot of these things, as it turns out, actually are solved problems. And so, you know, I mentioned Netlify and, and Matthias Billman earlier on, but really this, this, for me, has been a bit of a revelation. I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm working for them. Um, and there are other companies that do some similar things, but th some of the capabilities there have really unlocked a lot. And so I want to dig into that a tiny bit. 
So, you know, I mentioned a website being a, a bunch of static things, and that's, you know, I'm still sticking to that for the moment with this static architecture. But I just want to kind of look at how that comes about in this kind of this modern world. And so really, you know, if we can have some build tools that, you know, are getting popular anyway, that output a website, and if we can add some kind of automation to that, and then also just provide some API endpoints, and this is what Netlify's hosting service does. They create places for us to post the data that we don't have to manage ourselves. And so when you plug these things together, you end up with a very, very capable system, and actually the piece that you have to worry about is just generating static assets. I could go into it in a bit more detail, and I'll touch on it a bit more later on. But it does mean that we can unlock a lot of these things. That's all well and good, but even then, you know, it always feels like there's just you know, one more thing. There's always one more capability that we haven't quite got to yet. Um, we need you know, to do something that isn't catered for with some of these solutions. So what I'm arguing is that if you encounter that, there's no need to put this architecture in the bin. What can we do to extend it? How can we use things like microservices to extend that? And so I'm going to shrink this down again and wrap this in a box. And this is you know, the, the building blocks that Netlify bring us to output a static site. And I'm kind of interested in how we can lean on other services outside of that that can then extend the capabilities of a static site. Let me give you an example. Um, you know, this is, this is a very simple example, and you, know, you might say, well, that's not purely microservices, but actually it's, I'm thinking about very simple, uh, uh, single-purpose services that you don't have to manage and own. And so this in, it, in this example, I'm just, I often use my own uh, site as a guinea pig for these things. Uh, and in this example, I'm looking at the footer of my site. And down at the bottom, you know, I've got some recent tweets that are on there. Now, Many ways that you could do that, but on a static site, that's difficult. It's important that I have this on my site because some of these tweets are gold. Um, it's always important uh, to, uh, to, to be able to share this kind of thing. By the way, uh, just a word to the wise, um, if you ever are working from home and you're having a difficult conversation with your project team and you don't understand why they're not taking you seriously, it's, your, it's because your cat has snuck in and is yawning behind you. You're being heckled by your own cat. It's hard to be taken seriously. I discovered I'm not the first person uh, to encounter that. You know, other people have also had, uh, had problems, um, and it can, it can really sour you. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's by the by. How do we get these things on the site without having to rebuild it all the time, regenerate it? As I mentioned, there's you know, approximately one gazillion ways to implement this, but my site is a static site. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to lean on some of, these, some of these tools? Well, let's consider what we're trying to achieve, first of all, getting you know, regular tweets onto a, onto a site that we you know, can't, can't serve up uh, on demand. Um, so what kind of considerations, options have we got? Well, you know, we could certainly use a client-side Twitter JavaScript widget. Twitter you know, happily provides us with those. But you know, I'm not too keen on the kind of level of design control that gives us. You know, it's their branding. They just plop the UI onto your page. Um, you've got dependencies for the rendering then as well by introducing JavaScript as a dependency before you can render that content. And also, that content isn't part of your site. It's invisible. You know, it's never part of what is indexed. Um, so I don't really like that. Um, you could you know, write your own kind of client-side uh, JavaScript to, to consume the Twitter feed. And well, you'll have more control over the design of this, but you know, the same considerations apply about rendering dependencies, invisible content, and so on. So you know, really, maybe we want it as part of the HTML. Well, that's fine, but if you don't have a dynamic back end, you know, you're just going to end up with stale content. How do you keep on re, uh, recompiling this uh, to, to make that uh, automatic? And so this is when I'm starting to look at the services outside of my environment. Um, you know, I'm going to describe this in a little bit more detail. Uh, and sorry, it's late. We've been here for three days. I might go th quickly through this to skip along, because um, there's lots of lines and boxes. But ultimately, you know, my local build, my static site generator, takes a blob of content and a bunch of templates, and it runs it through a build, and it out, spits out a static site. And that's in my development, local development environment. And you know, if I want to get that live, then I just take that output, my site, and I push it to a hosting environment. That could be anything. That could be um, S3. It could be on uh, uh, Heroku. It could be anywhere. It could be anything that can serve static files. But really, the power then becomes you know, when I take the moving parts, the piece that I craft, um, and I put those into a repository. 
and then that repository can get slurped up by the hosting provider. In this case, I'm thinking about Netlify, because Netlify can run the same build, and then I don't need to be pushing the output of the build. It's just happening every time I check in my code with the content, um, it generates the build for me and outputs it. And on it goes to do CDN work and all kinds of bits and pieces that are too complicated for me to care about. So there's lots of lines and boxes on there, but really it's just those three pits colored in that I'm really, really managing. So then the power comes when we can start abstracting the content. Where can we manage the content so it's outside of the site, so outside of what I need to maintain? I never want to manage a CMS, ever. Um, and so tools like Contentful, again, we heard from Stefan the other day, you know, can provide content management as a service. And you, know, they, you can manage your content, manage assets on something that someone else hosts and provides for you. And then your build can drink that in at build time, whether it's in your local environment or indeed in your production environment, because the nice thing is that this production environment can listen for a webhook. And so whenever the content changes in this, in this uh, CMS hosted by someone else, it fires a webhook, your build runs as if by magic your site is updated. That's fine, but I've made no mention of Twitter here at the moment. And really, I'm just tweet, treat, I'm tweeting. I'm treating Twitter, oh dear. I'm treating Twitter as a, uh, another data source here. You know, we know that there are data feeds from Twitter, and I just want to drink those in in the same way to my build. But how do I, how do I trigger the build? How do I make that happen every time I tweet? There's no push happening here in this build mechanism. So triggering the build um, becomes the, the key. Ideally, I want some kind of a watcher, something that's going to consume the Twitter API, and when it sees an update, it wants to fire a webhook, run my build, and off I go. That seems like a good solution, but this is something I need to host, I need to maintain, I need to keep it running somewhere. Um, it seems like a very simple solution to that. Actually, it might just be throw it onto if this, then that. And the nice thing about if this, then that, that I'm sure most people will be familiar with this, this service, um, is that you can you know, run very, very simple things that you don't need to ever maintain. The, the number of channels that if this, then that uh, uh, support is getting broader and broader. And one of the things that excited me fairly recently is that they, they added webhooks here. You can both fire, create webhooks, uh, and you can also trigger events based on receiving an incoming webhook. And that is really powerful. It means that you know, I can now, I don't need to build anything. I just configure this little service that listens for a tweet from my Twitter account. And when it sees something that you know, it, it deems to be a tweet from me, it will just fire an HTTP request to the endpoint that I've suggested. And Netlify allows me the option to do that. You know, there's my, my Netlify uh, URL that will trigger my build. Um, and whenever that's fired, you know, off it goes. So I've rewritten this a tiny bit. You know, so the content that I've abstracted away, the content as a service, I now put, describe that as sources. That might be my CMS, that might be Twitter, might be anything that can output a feed. Um, so many of those. And those can then you know, be consumed by my build in production whenever there's a change. But how do we trigger it? Well, that's when we have something like this, if, if this, then that, that's watching for those, those changes and fires the build. But going quickly because you know, I'm, I'm not, too, uh, not too long on time. But so this is there's lots of lines and boxes there, but it's actually a fairly simple thing that we're talking about. We're talking about firing a build whenever we see some activity on a feed. And in, which, in this way, we can do something simple, like rebuild a website um, and, and output something that feels very dynamic. But that's all well and good, but you know, it feels like we need, we need a bit more power. And if you're looking at this image and thinking, I've really shoehorned in a Star Trek reference just, just because I wanted it, that would be fair. But if I was really wanting to do that, I wouldn't have used this image. I would have used this image. Um, I don't know what's happening in this image. I, don't, I can't think of a headline to put across it, so I couldn't use it. Uh, so I just use it as my water break. I think it's important that we all get to enjoy this image. So many questions. Does anyone know what was happening in this episode of Star Trek? Nobody. I saw a hand. There is a hand. OK, we're going to talk later. Really need to know. So we need more power, we need, we need more control o over what we're, we're doing here. My example there was fairly simplistic, although you could reuse it in lots of different ways. But really, you know, with, with this kind of, uh, this model that we're talking about, you know, what I just described is something that happens at build time. I'm really interested in things that can happen at runtime with microservices as well. So 
Now, how do we start to add this kind of server-side logic, if you might like to call it, for a static site? Well, I'm going to move things around again a little bit here and try and simplify this diagram. Consider everything in that box just to be a static site, regardless of how it's been generated. You know, how do we then start to add some kind of server-side logic for things that we, we can't do on a static site? Well, it turns out that there are nice ways that you can just handle routing. So you can you know, service requests from the client you know, that can be serviced from a static site straight from them. But if there are things that you, you actually need to do something dynamically, you can route them to somewhere else. And you can do that invisibly. So for me, this is, this is this notion of offloading complexity, which perhaps would be a better title for this talk. I kind of sometimes talk about using other people's plumbing, but that's a horrible, horrible expression. Um, you know, I think there's a real trend towards offloading complexity these days. And the stacks, the kind of the technology stacks, are actually starting to get a bit simpler, or can do. So if we look at some infrastructure uh, trends, you know, once upon a time, we used to have to own all of the metal of our environment. You know, we used to have to manage the servers, manage the racks they were in, manage the power, manage the network, manage the backups, everything. You know, and then it got to the point that you would rent space uh, in a rack in some kind of data center. And then it moved on, you start to rent um, a virtual private server you know, in, from, in some hosted infrastructure. And it got even more granular. You start to rent space in a virtual server. And it kind of moved on. And we're now at the point that you know, we're, we're starting to rent CPU time for a function, just for single functions. And this is the thing that's starting to get me really excited. You know, the fact that we can start to define functions that do a thing, just a single, very uh, atomic thing. Um, and that can be located on a URL. And so you can invoke this function with a request to this URL. And so doing this in this way, actually it means that we can let someone else maintain all of the, the magic that has to happen to keep a service alive and just start writing code, which is what many of us are good at. We're not all DevOps people. So I'm sure lots of people have encountered some of these services already. Uh, Amazon Lambda is, of course, the, the one that comes to mind the most. And that's, you know, it's the, it's the gateway drug. Alexa is the gateway drug, really, for, uh, um, for Lambdas. Um, and so, you know, lots of us potentially have played with Alexa, wanted to write a skill, and this is the way in, you know, writing these single function, functions that live in lambdas. Um, but there are, there are other services as well. It's not just Amazon. You know, Google Cloud Functions uh, exists. Uh, Microsoft are getting into the game as well with uh, um, Azure Functions. There's IBM OpenWhisk as well. And all of these things that can, are things that can live down in this bottom layer that you don't need to ever maintain. You're just writing the code. Now, that's all well and good, but how are we going to be doing the routing if we've just got a static site? Well, I'm going to give you a, an example again from Netlify. Uh, I know that I'm favoring them a lot, but I'm just really impressed and having fun with it. Um, and so there is a file that you can output as part of your build uh, in, uh, on, in a static site on Netlify. It's just called underscore redirects. It's just a text file. And you can start creating very simple, but actually very powerful redirection rules there. So it's the, the destination, sorry, the, the, the source that you're matching and the destination that you want to, to map that to. And that will route those requests to that destination. And so you can start you know, doing things like cleaning up um, the file extensions. You can start you know, taking care of when you've changed URLs in the past. I used to have my blog site on journal because I thought it sounded fancy. Uh, and then I decided, well, actually, that's no good. No users are left behind now. I can map those routes right through. And the nice thing is that in this file as well, you can start to actually specify the type of HTTP response that you're, uh, that you're, you're giving. So the kind of re redirect uh, that you're, you're serving, you can define. You can start defining things like custom 404s. And those can be, you can uh, serve different 404 messages at different parts of your, of your site. So it actually gets to be quite, quite interesting. It gets very powerful at the point that you realize that this hosting is managed on distributed CDNs globally. And so they're starting to do things uh, close to where the users are. And they can start to uh, apply redirect rules based on things like the country that the, the user is in. So if the users are in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, then you can start directing those users to a particular part of your site. So localization, which is something that can be a real pain, is actually becomes almost trivial in this kind of a model. Um, you can uh, key on not just the country that people are in, but things like their language settings. So you can start to really 
put together very complex, very powerful things here um, that does localization and translation. So, but it starts to get a bit more interesting, and I've already mentioned kind of wildcards and splats here so that you can be doing matching and passing variables through to, to the destination. Um, and that, of course, is something that is critical if you want to start doing proxying. And this is the thing that I'm really excited about because it means that we can be handling requests to a URL in our domain and silently passing it through to something else, proxying it, returning a 200, uh, and then serving a response. So that unlocks all kinds of things for, um, uh, for these microservices that are elsewhere. So I'm going to go quickly through an example. Um, I'm shortish on time. So for user-generated content, let's have a simple use case. I work in an agency, so chances are I've heard a scenario like this before. There's a campaign, and we want users to be able to learn about that campaign, so there's some content about that. And we might want a feature where the, the user can actually create some kind of custom experience. They might want to create a poster, uh, and let's say they can upload an image, give it a, put some kind of messaging on there, and it generates a custom poster for them that they can get on a unique URL, share, save, do what have you. It's a use case that I encounter more often than you might expect. And I would immediately reject a static site model for this, of course, because there's so much that's automatic and generated. But let's just hold on a second. You know, if we actually look at this, you know, think about a home page, the about page where people might learn about the, 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 the product, the campaign page, again, that you might learn a bit of information, somewhere that you can create this UI that you're starting to customize things, putting your message in, choosing an image, um, and then the output of that, a page where you can consume that and share it onwards, the thing that you've generated. When we actually start to break this down, actually there's only one piece here that actually is really dynamic. All of this is static. Even the UI that is creating this output, that's a static form. It's just that you're populating it, or the user is populating it. So it's just the generation and the consumption part which is, is uh, dynamic. So this means that you know, we can actually start to have a static site serving the most part, and then these functions as a service serving the last part. We might route you know, the home directory, uh, sorry, the home URL, the about URL, the campaign, the creation part to the static site, serving static pages and assets, and then elsewise URLs to the poster or to a particular poster with an ID going off to the, being routed to the functions that then do the work, generate things, deal with databases, and then generate custom posters and, and return them. Now, I'm simplifying things because I'm going fast, but you can see how we can start to break things off and pass those small pieces off to something very specific. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, but, you know, if we're talk, starting to talk about doing things like managing lambdas, managing abs, uh, Amazon Web ser Services can sometimes be a little tricky. Now, I'm paraphrasing myself quite heavily there because I'm in polite company. Um, but thankfully, there are loads of tools to help. You know, there are things like serverless framework, which is a wrapper that sits on top of things like Lambda and Google Cloud Functions and the other leading services. That helps to really build out an interesting and useful workflow for you to build things on. There are other services like, like WebTask, where you know, it's very, very simple to start experimenting with creating a function and having that at an endpoint. And you can use that right from their site. You can start experimenting. Things like Standard Lib are another uh, interesting uh, player who are starting to, to, make it, to put a lot of focus on the workflow of creating these things and actually then starting to share these functions that you've created. Think about it as you know, NPM for functions as a service. So there's a lot, and I've gone very quickly, and I apologize for that, but I just want to stop right there and just think about some of the takeaways for this. There's great power in avoiding responsibility. Now, I think that the publishers of Spider-Man are going to come after me pretty aggressively uh, if they ever see this. But really what I'm talking about as I corrupt this kind of this quote is that you know, we need to choose the right things to own, the right things to take responsibility for, because it's hard to be an expert in everything, but we can be experts in some things. So let's experts in the other things deal with that, and let's just you know, offload that. I'd also advise that it, you know, don't be afraid to start small here. You know, I, I, I showed things with lots of lines and lots of boxes, but ultimately the simplest instance of this is just handing off one request to one function. And it's, it can be quite powerful quite quickly, so don't be afraid to start small. And it feels quite intimidating, so my last piece of advice is don't 
don't be intimidated by this. You know, we've already had conversations today about tooling and how tooling and, and uh, dev tools are really getting richer. Isn't that amazing? Come on. Hmm. And so the tooling is coming, so it might feel quite daunting, quite daunting at the moment, but really the tooling is coming and it's getting much, much more approachable. So going back to what I said at the very beginning, complexity can be a barrier, but simplicity can be an enabler. So I'm very keen to offload the complexity for other people to, to deal with. I've heard people kind of talk about simplifying as being something that's bad, but simplifying is not dumbing down. I've said it many times that it actually lets us to focus on what matters. So my timer says 31 minutes. I think the timer down here said something much greater before it went red. Um, and so normally this would be the end of my talk. You know, this would be my conclusion. But I've already shown you that graph that gets us from when I started to the end of the conference. No one's taking me off the stage just yet. The doors are locked. So you know, is that all? You know, what else have we learned? Well. First thing we've learned is it's hard to teach all about neural networks in 30 minutes. Uh, Rosie did a bloody good job, but uh, there's a lot trying to go into my brain at the moment. And uh, that was the understatement of the century when she said that. Uh, fascinating though it was. Um, but there's other things I just want to reflect on from the last three days. You know, Vitaly, a couple of days ago on Monday, you know, he talked about transparency being a hallmark of our, our industry. And never a truer word spoken, I think. You know, it's the cornerstone of our community, I think. You know, we share so much of our knowledge. That's why events like this happen. You know, Vitaly's talk you know, really exposed some things that other people might have been you know, keen to withhold. You know, he talked about the fact that the ad model that was driving his business was starting to, to decline, to falter. And he shared with us how he was going to adapt and change things there always putting you know, the user experience at the heart of things, caring about what the users were going to do, and he's being very transparent about the business and how he's going to change. I think that's amazing. And this, this thought of sharing and transparency has been throughout the, the, the conference. You know, Yuma showed us incredible things with CSS that got lots of us going ooh and ah, and I was very much one of them. You know, sharing techniques like this are, are amazing, and they're really inspiring. Helps us all to improve together. Now, we heard from Sam about how browsers could do much, so much more than we thought, you know, looking at the speech API, geolocation, push notifications, so much more, seeing how the gaps between applications and the web are closing. Now, we heard from Adam about considering the audience and considering the users and how building tools for communities to use can be really beneficial. Now, and it, again, reinforcing this notion of kind of sharing our craft and sharing the tools. I really like Mihai's uh, statement of saying we have to decide what the web can be when he was looking at authoring tools. You know, he's saying the web is an inflection point and there's so much going on. Now, if we look back, back to the very, very start of the, the three days, Maciej said this. He said, what we learn at these conferences is futile. And I've, I've made that look very negative. But you know what? I, was, I understand exactly what he's talking about. You know, the rate of change is what he was saying. The rate of change is so high that you know, keeping on top of this thing is, these things is really difficult. And I think the talks that we've seen throughout the days would attest to that. You know, we've heard incredible stories from people like Jack, who talked about the pains and the victories of migrating to new technologies as they emerge. You know, Val taught us about animations and the power of animation and what it can do and how we can kind of bring those into our processes. Patrick and Martin and others have been talking about performance, and there's been so much more. So, Yes, the rate of change is frightening, but you know, we drive that. We push these things forward. You know, in one of the final talks, Chris said this. He said, hacking or experimenting, we create our own path. And so I think that's a really exciting point to leave on. You know, we've shared a lot over the last few days. And the thing that I really want to ask is, you know, which, which direction should we go? So with that, I'm going to relinquish my time um, I would just like to say thank you, first of all, for listening to me uh, without wanting someone to come and interrupt me and take me off the stage. Um, I also want to thank all of the speakers who've been here at Front Trends. I think, we, I think all of the speakers deserve a big round of applause uh, for the last three days. So let's have a round of applause for them.
Also, also while, we're, while we're doing some thank yous, I think we should also thank all of the volunteers who make today possible, or the last three days possible. There's an army of people working for this event, um, you know, whether those are people doing the AV, the facilities, the catering, manning the stalls, doing all kinds of things, bring this to life. So let's have a round of applause for all the volunteers. I'd, uh, I'd also like us to, to come together and thank the organizers of this event. Um, there's so much that's happening behind the scenes to get speakers from all, of the world, all over the world here to talk, taking great care of all of the speakers, making everything come together. So a huge round of applause for the organizers, I think, please. <laughs> um, On a, on a personal note, I'd like to thank the organizers, myself, for inviting me and allowing me to be part of this. It's a huge privilege to be part of this event and for um, letting me run riot with the last end of the format. You know, anything could have happened, so thank you, thank you ever so much. And then the, the final thank you is to all of you for coming and being part of the event. Um, it's wonderful to be surrounded by so many people having such great discussions, uh, being forced to drink uh, strange vodka at different times of the day. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's been wonderful. So my last thank you is to all of you. So thank you very much.